What's up everybody? I hope you're uh, safe and healthy. Welcome back to the next uh, short video on chapter 2, Film Language. Now, last time I gave you a basic introduction uh, to why we are talking about film narratives or narrative films. Uh, I explained the function of the narrator and the focalizer and how these two functions work together in the building up of uh, the narrative world, which we call diegesis and how this diegetic realm uh, can be interpreted and comprehended by the viewer, the spectator. I also introduced the two uh, terms, again used in combination, the sujet and the fabula, or the plot and the story. And I also gave you some creative homework. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you had some time to uh, dedicate to the development of your critical skills in terms of uh, film criticism and film theory. Today, I'm going to move on and move to uh, two larger questions within uh, the tackling of language and film. Uh, one topic will be the Soviet montage um, theory. We call it theory, it's not really a theory. You will see. And to the film filmolinguist project uh, of the 60s and then 70s, uh, heralded by our, our all time uh, film theory hero, Christian Metz. So let's jump into it and let's start with the Soviets. So as you know, uh, following the great Soviet revolution uh, in the late uh, 1910s, early 20s, uh, they tried to solve the problem of uh, informing the population about the new political setup, the new uh, political regime. Now, the problem was that the majority of the population at the time in Russia was either illiterate or they couldn't really reach them uh, through pamphlets or, well, they didn't have radio, they didn't have television, so they didn't have the uh, media and propaganda tools that we have today. So early on they came up with the idea of uh, using the silent film, uh, silent movies, as a way to convey the new message uh, so that everybody in Russia will realize that the Tsar is gone and there's a new regime uh, building up. So what they did uh, was basically to find a way to get these silent films, these movies, uh, to even the smallest of villages. Uh, because with cities, obviously, it's easy, I mean, easier, uh, but uh, with uh, far away um, villages and, and settlements, uh, it's pretty difficult. So what they figured out is, let's put the movie theater itself on the train and let's travel throughout Russia and show the same films to all the population so that it becomes clear uh, that there is a new political uh, agenda here. Now, this is the uh, logistics of uh, vision, but how do we make films that will inform them? How do we raise the attention? How do we convey this kind of new message uh, to the masses? So what they did basically was going against everything that Hollywood did at the time. If you remember from uh, lecture one, uh, you remember that Hollywood was striving to create a perfect narrative machinery in which the viewer is invited into an immersive um, experience. That is, the viewer should forget about reality, his or her own reality, and partake of uh, the reality that is building up in front of their eyes. Uh, that's why we still love Hollywood, right? Uh, the Russians, the Soviets, however, they had a somewhat different approach. They did not believe in lulling the viewer. They didn't want to create alternative realities. They wanted to tell about the new reality out there. So what to do then? Well, instead of uh, using the American way of telling stories, uh, they wanted to wake the viewers, the spectators up. They wanted to trigger social action instead of uh, creating an immersive experience. To do that, basically what they wanted to do or what they did, they went down and started to define the basic building blocks of film. Now, 
no surprises there because Eisenstein and uh, his fellow uh, engineers, because they were engineers, not really artists or filmmakers. So Eisenstein came up with this nice mathematical formula. He said that Hollywood, what Hollywood movie does is basically one plus one equals two. Uh, which is, yes, that's how we learn it at school, and that's what Hollywood does. One shot next to another shot basically gives you the sum of these shots, but it doesn't really convey any extra uh, messages. And that's what we need. That's what we have as an ideological extra according to this logic. So the Soviet formula will be one plus one equals three. So once again, what it means is that shot one and shot two, when they come together, they do not continue the train of thought as uh, laid out in the, in the first or the second, but they give you a third image, a mental image, an ideologically defined and constructed image that you take home. And basically, this is uh, this image is the most important part of the formula, of course, and that's why because it's not really the sum of the first two; it's a separate, singled out image uh, that is only in your brain, that is only in your thoughts, in, only in your interpretation. That's what Eisenstein is driving uh, at, and basically, the the formula creates a kind of a conflict. Conflict is really important in political and ideological terms as well but also for Eisenstein and uh, his fellow uh, filmmakers, it's a, a structuring principle. So conflict, conflict between shot one and shot two will create a third uh, shot, a third image, and that's what is important for them. So that's basically the uh, pivotal part of what we call intellectual montage, as you will see in the text. Another part of the experimentation at the time was uh, more geared toward the psychological uh, comprehension of film, that is how we can manipulate the comprehension of the audiences without them uh, realizing what we are doing. Um, the name that you need to remember here is Kuleshov. Now we have a nice psychological experiment, the Kuleshov effect, basically that's the name for the uh, experiment, where Kuleshov took one image, uh, a still image of an actor, and then showed another image that was completely unrelated to that face. The face of the actor, Ivan Mosyukin, was uh, kind of neutral, and then he introduced other images, uh, first, let's say, a tomb in a graveyard, and then cut back to the same face of Ivan Mosyukin, the actor, the same neutral expression. Guess what happens? When you see the face for the second time, that, it, that is after you were shown uh, the graveyard, you will see or, well, you will feel that the face has changed. Now you will spot the signs of grieving, uh, the signs of sadness and, and the like. Take it away. Do it again. Again you have the face of the actor. Let's uh, show a bowl of soup and then the face of the actor. Once again you will realize that you will see uh, hunger on the face. You will see that Ivan uh, wants to taste that bowl of soup. And again, the trick is that the image, the face, it hasn't changed a bit. So that's basically how our brain connects uh, two images because it tries to find some relation between uh, the images. And that actually can manipulate your comprehension of uh, film uh, or filmic narratives. So basically they use these, I mean, they use many more, you will find in the textbook, you will find many more examples, but these are the basic tenets of how Soviet montage as a practice, and then later on developed into a kind of a critical attitude or theory, we might say, how it worked and how it was used in uh, Soviet films. Another significant uh, person um, whom we need to mention here is Giga Vertov. He was the most poetic of the branch, basically. Um, you might remember his film, uh, The Man with the Movie Camera from uh, 1925, I believe. Uh, look it up. 
homework for you guys. Uh, here he introduces a nice concept of the Kino eye, that is the movie eye, uh, which he thinks is a kind of a prosthesis uh, which perfects human vision. That is, in his vision, uh, the mechanic part, that is the camera, the lenses, the filmic material, the, the film stock, it's used as, a, as an extension of how we see the world around us and it creates a more objective uh, view of reality, uh, which then can be obviously uh, edited into powerful montage sequence, as you can see. So his aim was really capturing real life, getting to the real of reality, the real core of reality, and show how uh, people really live. Apart from uh, the Soviet montage school, um, we have another great tendency within uh, film narratology or the study of film language, uh, and that is um, the project initiated by Christian Metz in the 60s in France. He was basically using structuralist ideas, uh, but in a more post-structuralist way, uh, because he was using the linguistic basis of language, uh, of general linguistics, uh, as introduced by Ferdinand de Saussure, uh, to study film, or at least to give an impetus for the study of film, because at the time, in the 60s, film studies did not really exist. So basically, you can see this project with all its faults and problems as a precursor to the academic initiation of uh, film. Now, what he was using from uh, Saussure is basically uh, the abstraction of language. Um, he wanted to prove that film is a kind of a language, even if uh, it's not the same as natural languages. But he loved the, the method of how Saussure boiled down the logic, the grammar of language. Uh, in other words, he wanted to create the same or analogous system, analogous abstract system of film language to prove the language-like behavior that we often experience when watching films. Now, as you might remember, the uh, smallest, once again, we need to get to the smallest building block. The smallest building block uh, of language, according to Saussure, is the sign, the linguistic sign, which has two parts, uh, the signifier, which is basically nothing else but a sound image, and a signified, which is a mental image, which pops up in our head. So if I say apple, or if you see it written on a page, um, you will immediately think of an apple. Uh, funny thing is that it's not related to reality. Uh, if it were, then everybody would have the very same mental image of the very same apple. And that never happens. Uh, which proves that language is virtual and language is based on convention, social convention, and it has no uh, referentiality to the reality out there. In other words, it can work without uh, reality. So this is the uh, building block, and this is what Metz tries to use in his analysis of film language, if there is uh, such a thing as film language, because it was a question even for him as well. Now, if film can be considered a language, then we can compare the basic constituent of film language to the linguistic analogy. In other words, we have the uh, sign on the one hand, uh, and we have something in film which might be related to it. And here's the first problem. We cannot go to that abstract level in film, unfortunately, because it works in a completely different manner. So what Metz did as a kind of a solution for him is comparing the shot, which is for him as well, just like for Eisenstein, the shot will be the basic uh, building uh, block or constituent of film, of the filmic language. And he went back to 
uh, the analogy, the linguistic analogy, and he found that the smallest level or the lowest level where we can get with language which would be similar to the shot is not the linguistic sign, but already words themselves. So you see, it's a more complicated because we have comp uh, connotation, denotation, and all the rest uh, with words. We have multiple meanings, so it can get really tedious in the comparison. So what he did, he compared shots with words. And let's see how far he got. Basically, the comparison lists a number of differences, a number of problems. Uh, here is a short list. Whereas shots are infinite, potentially infinite in number, words are finite and they are fixed in a lexicon. You cannot make up any word. I mean, you can make up words, but because language works based on convention, it doesn't mean that others will accept uh, that new word into the lexicon, into uh, the general uh, pool of uh, possible words. The other problem is that the shots are creations of a filmmaker or many filmmakers, whereas words pre-exists uh, pre -exist in a lexicon again or in a dictionary that you can learn. There is a finite number, whereas because it's an individual creation, the shot will always be uh, unlimited and it's created by uh, the specific filmmakers themselves. The next problem is that a shot can convey an unlimited uh, quality, uh, quantity of undefined information, whereas with words we have uh, defined information and only what uh, that word is allowed to convey. In other words, when you look at an image, it might convey millions and trillions of things to you because there's no fixed interpretation to that. There's no meaning attached to that image. It's in, it's your encounter with the image that gives uh, rise to meaning. Whereas with words, the problem is that you have, I mean, that's not a problem, but problem in the analogy, you have a fixed meaning and that's not to change uh, when you're using them. Again, uh, this leads us to another problem that let's imagine a dog. Got it? I bet that your imagination created a completely different dog uh, than mine or your fellow students, precisely because um, the word dog is a purely virtual lexical unit. Whereas if you uh, watch a film and a dog appears, everybody who watches that film will identify the very same dog in the sequence because the dog in the shot is what we call an actualized unit. So the actualized unit of film goes against the purely virtual lexical unit uh, of language. So these are the uh, problems that Matt uh, encounters in trying to um, lay the, the foundation for arguing that there is a film language. So it's clear that uh, these differences outweigh uh, the potential similarities. However, uh, Metz still insisted that film uh, works somewhat like language. It's not language per se, he accepts that, but he argues that there is a logic to it, a linguistic or language-like logic to how film conveys meaning. Now, um, if it's not the words, if it's not the shots, then let's go level up. And he argues that basically we can find this language-like logic uh, in the working of film on the syntagmatic level. That is when we start to combine the words or shots. And he's talking about uh, different kinds of sequences and scenes. Now he, and this is one part of the criticism that he did not really work with uh, um, alternative or art movies. Uh, the sole aim for him was to study commercial narrative cinema, potentially it's Hollywood, obviously. So how narrative cinema uh, works like a language. And he comes up with, basically he comes up with this system, the syntagmatic system, which he calls the Grand Syntagmatique, uh, in which he lists eight eight uh, syntagmas that recur uh, in uh, narrative cinema. Um, you will see that sometimes it's 
pretty idiosyncratic how he defines them and how he lists them or the selection itself is really Metz's selection. Uh, but it gives you again some ground uh, to think about uh, the linguistic or language capacities of uh, film, uh, narrative film. The first, just let's run through them. Uh, the first is the autonomous shot. This is the simples, this is the building block and he included it uh, here. Then we have the parallel syntagma, which is a kind of a conceptual contrasting device, war and peace, love and hate. Uh, these are, well, on the, these work on the thematic level, not necessarily on the visual or on the uh, narrative level, but they can. Then the third one is the bracket syntagma, where uh, the film introduces some routine-like activity, uh, which is a framing and bracketing uh, device, so that you can understand that there is a change, which we call in narrative terms, event. Then we have uh, number four, the descriptive syntagma, which is basically a succession of uh, shots which create a spatial contiguity. That is, you will feel that uh, if you have a shot of the uh, clock on the wall, if you have a shot of the armchair, if you have a shot of the television set, then uh, because they come one after the other, they, com they convey a continuous space in which the character will appear. That's it. Then we have number five alternating syntagma which was usually uh, referred to before Matt as narrative cross-cutting. This is when there's a chaser and the chased. That's the easiest definition of it. Then uh, we as you, rem as you might have realized we are moving from the simplest one to the more complicated ones. Number five we have the scene uh, which is basically a continuous event which might be segmented, that is, uh, it might be distributed throughout uh, longer sequences, but then as you uh, put together the parts of the plot and you create your fabula, your story, you will realize that they belong together. And then number seven, we have the episodic sequence which brings together longer sequences with dissolves, fade-outs, fade-ins and the like. Uh, this is already something, uh, again, on the higher level of complication. And then finally, we have number eight, the ordinary uh, sequence uh, in which unnecessary details are left out. If you realize uh, nobody ever goes to the toilet in Hollywood movies, for example, because that's not important in terms of the plot. Nobody goes to the restaurant, nobody has breakfast, nobody does this or that, because concerning the plot, uh, it's irrelevant. That's why they leave it out. So if you put together how the event uh, progresses from one step to another, you will see that many of the fragments of everyday expectations are left out. Now that's an ordinary uh, sequence for you. Now, as I mentioned, this approach got severe criticism, and yet this was probably the first ever academic attempt at creating a, a feasible frame to discuss the way narrative films communicate. Now, while Metz was definitely working with cinema in its totality, uh, one of the severe, one part of the criticism aimed precisely at his linguistic uh, occupation. Um, because this trend in criticism maintained that he was losing sight of one of the most predominant uh, features of the moving image, image itself. That is, how to make sense of the uh, visuality of film when we are talking about the linguistic or storytelling ca capabilities or capacities of the medium. Now, um, a French critic and theorist, André Gaudreau, uh, came up with the idea that let's go back to the definition of diegesis, uh, of the diegetic realm, and let's go back to Aristotle, basically, and see how, how he framed uh, the distinction between diegetic and mimetic narrative. And Gaudreau comes up with this idea that when you start to watch a film, the very first image of the star, of the character, of the, I don't know, of the scene in front of you, cannot yet connect to any editing sequ edited uh, sequences. In other words, the image that appears, appears in front of you as a pure image. It's not yet inserted into a narrative sequence. It does not have anything to tell you in terms of a full-blown narrative. So this image 
acts as a kind of a mimetic insertion uh, in the narrative uh, diegetic Rian. So what he uh, offers is basically the combination or the lamination of the mimetic, uh, the visual, the pure image part of the uh, movie and the narrative, the already edited and sequentially organized part of the movie. And these two uh, in constant play with each other, they will make up uh, the film uh, as it appears uh, in front of you, as it appears on the screen. And this is a very important addition to the discussion of film language because it acknowledges the two-faced nature of filmic narration and basically introduces or leads to the problems that we can see uh, when we start to study adaptation, which will be the next topic in the next video. Thanks for watching.